Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Before we get into this one, quick note that I will be shaving off my moustache this month in support of mental health research. I encourage all of you to donate to our fundraiser for this worthy cause, links in the description below. Anyway, today we are checking out the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3050 laptop GPU following on from last week's benchmarking of the RTX 3050 Ti. Personally, I wasn't that impressed with the 3050 Ti. It has a number of problems, including its limited 4GB of VRAM, a downgrade from the GPUs it's replacing, and poor performance relative to the tier above RTX 3060 laptop GPU. All up, I felt it was a poor value offering and that most buyers should consider spending slightly more money on a 3060 laptop instead. But the RTX 3050 is in a bit of a different position. It's cheaper than the RTX 3050 Ti, typically saving you $100 in an otherwise equivalent laptop. It's currently the lowest end GPU in Nvidia's gaming series outside of MX GPUs, making it destined for a range of entry level systems. It's also directly replacing the GTX 1650 Ti rather than facing a much harder battle to replace the GTX 1660 Ti. Now when I say directly replacing the GTX 1650 Ti, I'm talking about the market position Nvidia is giving to the new RTX 3050. Nvidia says laptops using this new GPU should start around $800, US though in practice the floor on pricing is more like $900 right now. Of course we are in quite a volatile market for hardware prices, but if we take Nvidia's sort of MSRP for this product at face value, it should be directly replacing GTX 1650 Ti laptops that started at this price point in prior years, though it's not quite as cheap as the $700 GTX 1650 non-TI laptops, a price point that currently isn't being serviced in the market. So what are Nvidia giving buyers of entry-level gaming laptops in 2021? Well, the RTX 3050 uses the same GA107 die as the RTX 3050 Ti, so same Ampere architecture, same Samsung 8 nanometer process. However, it's a cut down version of this die with 16 SMs versus 20, and that comes with a corresponding reduction in CUDA cores to 2048, along with 16 RT cores and 64 tensor cores. In this area, it's a 20% cut to specifications. However, Nvidia is still giving the RTX 3050 the same power range, 35 to 80 watts, which leads to rated boost clock speeds of 1740 MHz at 80 watts and 1057 MHz at 35 watts. Like with all GPUs in Nvidia's lineup, it's crucial that you check the power rating for the laptop you're interested in, as both the 35 watt and 80 watt models have the same name, but will drastically differ in performance. If you get a 35 watt model, previously labeled Max-Q until Nvidia retired that brand, you can expect much lower performance than we'll show in this review. Memory layout is the same as the RTX 3050 Ti with 4 gigabytes of 12 gigabits per second GDDR6 on a 128-bit bus. I was critical of this amount of memory in my review of the 3050 Ti as it was a downgrade from the GTX 1660 Ti and RTX 2060 and even the GTX 1060, which all were equipped with 6 gigabytes, but this complaint is Somewhat less relevant here as the RTX 3050's 4 gigabyte is the same as the GTX 1650 Ti it's replacing. I would have loved to see an upgrade here for sure, but at least it's not a downgrade. The test system for today's benchmarking is the XMG Core 17, the same sort of laptop we tested with the RTX 3050 Ti, which will give us a great apples to apples platform to compare these two GPUs. However, I should mention here that this Core 17 version is a sample version only, as XMG decided to offer this laptop with only the RTX 3060. If you're interested in it though, we do have links in the description below. Internally, there is an Intel Core i7-11800H processor and 16GB of dual-channel DDR4-3200 memory, good quality stuff that doesn't hinder performance. There's also a 1080p 144Hz IPS display here, and for my configuration, 1TB of SSD storage. The GeForce RTX 3050 inside runs at between 80 and 95 watts with dynamic boost enabled, so we're getting a look at the highest power configuration Nvidia allows for this part. Resizable bar is also supported. The focus of today will be on 1080p testing with Optimus enabled, which is the default configuration in most laptops that sees the GPU's output routed through the iGPU to the display. You're unlikely to find MUX switches or higher resolution displays in this category of system, so we're not going to be talking about benchmarks at 1440p or using external displays, anything like that. On to the charts. Starting things off with Metro Exodus, and the RTX 3050 holds up pretty well, even though we are benchmarking at 1080p using ultra settings. 
This GPU is only 10% slower than the RTX 3050 Ti, but that still puts it 37% faster than the GTX 1650 Ti, and a decent 19% faster than the GTX 1066 GB from a few years ago. I suspect in a title like this that most people would opt to play on lower than ultra settings, where the 3050 is going to give a great experience in this sort of game, certainly well above what I would describe as not very playable with the 1650 Ti. In Borderlands 3, using mostly ultra settings at 1080p, the RTX 3050 is good for a near 60fps experience, which is pretty decent from Nvidia's new entry-level GPU. Now of course you will need to be using a laptop that utilizes the full 80 watts of power here, as we are in this case, but that means a significant step up in performance over the old GTX 1650 Ti, 43% higher frame rates on average, and it's only 9% slower than the RTX 3050 Ti. Red Dead Redemption 2 using high settings is actually not too bad using the RTX 3050, especially if you choose to enable DLSS quality mode, which we didn't test here. Natively though, performance is in the high 40s and only slightly behind the GTX 1660 Ti. We're ending up 8% slower than the RTX 3050 Ti and a decent 29% faster than the GTX 1650 Ti, once again giving us that win on the GTX 1060 as well. However, performance is quite away from the RTX 3060, as even in the 3060's 80 watt configuration, the 3050 is 30% slower. Resident Evil 2 using balanced settings is more your typical game running at medium graphics quality. In this title, the RTX 3050 is good for 120 FPS, just 8% less than the RTX 3050 Ti, and over 30% faster than the GTX 1650 Ti. Like we've been seeing in a number of these charts, I think that's a pretty good generation on generation improvement. The RTX 3050 is still very capable in competitive shooters like Rainbow Six Siege, running at native 1080p using medium settings. The RTX 3050 was chugging out over 200 FPS on average during the benchmark pass, just 7% less than the RTX 3050 Ti, and only 18% less than the RTX 3060. We are GPU limited here, unlike with higher tier GPUs, but that doesn't stop us from achieving excellent levels of performance. Unfortunately, like the RTX 3050 Ti, the RTX 3050 is VRAM limited in Assassin's Creed Valhalla when playing at 1080p very high settings. 4GB of VRAM is not enough in this game and that leads to a 10fps experience even at this resolution. If the VRAM buffer was larger, we'd probably be looking at around the 45fps mark, which would put it between the 1060 and 2060. With that said, if you settle for lower settings, the 3050 has no troubles with this game. Cyberpunk 2077 running using the Ultra preset is one of the most punishing game benchmarks we have today. The RTX 3050 using these settings is not that playable with a 31fps average and 25fps 1% low, however reducing the quality to medium will deliver you great results. But the point here isn't to show you the exact frame rates you'll be getting, but a comparison between the RTX 3050 and other GPUs. From this perspective, the 3050 is only 9% slower than the 3050 Ti, although that margin reduces when ray tracing is enabled due to VRAM limitations. Horizon Zero Dawn runs really well on the RTX 3050 despite using the ultimate quality preset at 1080p. Performance is around the 60fps mark which is playable in this sort of title, and only marginally behind the RTX 3050 Ti. It's just 6% slower here which is one of the smaller margins we've seen so far. Death Stranding is a bit different to Horizon in that margins are larger than in a lot of the titles we've looked at so far. The RTX 3050 laptop GPU is 13% slower than the RTX 3050 Ti in this title. It's still very playable on very high settings at 1080p, but the margin has grown. The final title we're taking a closer look at today is Dirt 5. The ultra high preset is a bit much for the RTX 3050 and the game does at times throw up a VRAM warning which leads to performance 11% behind that of the RTX 3050 Ti and 24% behind the RTX 3060 running at the same power limit. That's not a terrible result, though gamers with an RTX 3050 laptop will almost certainly want to run this game using lower quality settings. Now time for some head-to-head -head comparisons, and we'll start here with the RTX 3050 versus the RTX 3050 Ti, both configured using their maximum 80 to 95 watt power limits, and both using the same CPU. Not that the CPU makes much difference in this class of GPU, as you won't be CPU limited too often. At 1080p, on average the RTX 3050 is 8% slower than the RTX 3050 Ti, a modest margin. As both GPUs use the same amount of VRAM, there are no major outliers, though there are a couple of instances where performance doesn't differ too much between these GPUs due to VRAM limitations, like in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. 
The RTX 3050 is a substantial improvement on the GTX 1650 Ti it's replacing. Across a smaller 8 game sample from our previous benchmark suite that we have comparison data for, the RTX 3050 is a decent 35% faster on average, and again, VRAM isn't an issue as both have the same 4GB buffer. On top of this, the 3050 provides support for RTX features like DLSS, especially neat for this class of GPU, and ray tracing, though in my opinion this GPU and its VRAM size is a little underpowered for ray tracing, but that doesn't take away from what is a large gen-on-gen -gen improvement in the entry-level class. One interesting thing to note here though is the power differences. The GTX 1650 Ti topped out at 50 watts, that was the upper limit set by Nvidia, whereas this time the RTX 3050 can go all the way up to 80 watts and has Dynamic Boost 2.0 support for further power allocation. It would be interesting to compare these two parts both at the same 50 watts, as I suspect the power limits play a big part in performance. However, the higher power limit is also almost certainly necessary to support the higher CUDA core count this generation. Just for interest's sake as well, I've put up results here comparing the RTX 3050 to the GTX 1060 6GB, which was released for laptops almost 5 years ago to the date. The RTX 3050 is two tiers lower in terms of product class, but is still ending up 24% faster, including cases where the GPU is VRAM limited. If we remove the VRAM limited situations, the RTX 3050 is over 30% faster on average, so there's a good incentive here to upgrade your GTX 1060 laptop even if you don't go all the way up to an RTX 3060. Naturally though, the RTX 3050 is much slower than the RTX 3060. Comparing at the same power limits, the RTX 3050 is 28% slower on average, or 24% slower without some of the large outliers brought about by the VRAM size differences. That margin grows to 34%, or 31% without outliers, when we compare the maximum power limits of both parts. Of course, it's expected when you increase a couple of tiers that performance is much better, but hopefully this will assist buyers tossing up between various GPU models. Overall, I come away from testing the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3050 laptop GPU with a more positive position than when testing the RTX 3050 Ti. Especially after testing this new entry-level GPU, the 3050 Ti seems like the turd of the RTX 30 series mobile lineup to be honest. I simply can't recommend it, whereas with the RTX 3050, I feel there are some cases where it makes sense. For starters, the RTX 3050 is only 8% slower than the RTX 3050 Ti at 1080p, which is not a very large margin. This generally makes the RTX 3050 a better value buy, as if you had a 3050 laptop at $1,100 and a 3050 Ti laptop at $1,200, then we'd be looking at an 8% lower price for the 3050. But RTX 3050 systems tend to be cheaper than that, more in the $900 to $1,000 range, a price I'd be on the lookout for, which is where cost per frame starts heading in the 3050's favour, given the $100 difference between the two in most instances. You do have to be careful in this entry-level space that you don't start sacrificing a lot of other specs in chase of the cheapest laptop. Often RTX 3050 systems will also cut down on the CPU, RAM and storage, but even with a reasonable configuration, I feel the RTX 3050's value proposition is okay. I definitely think having 4GB of VRAM is much easier to justify here in the entry-level gaming laptop market than at any higher price tiers. It's still not ideal as some games will be VRAM limited, but at the cheapest tier these sorts of trade-offs are common. The really big positive is comparing the RTX 3050 to its direct predecessor, the GTX 1650 Ti. The RTX 3050 is 35% faster in what should be the same price tier, and includes support for DLSS and ray tracing, which may add value depending on your opinion of those features. This has come at the cost of power, with the highest limit raised from 50 watts to 80 watts, though I still feel this is highly manageable in most laptop form factors, and if anything, 50 watts was too stingy last generation. While the RTX 3050 is certainly the better of Nvidia's mainstream slash entry-level laptop GPUs, the main drawback here is when comparing it to the RTX 3060 laptop GPU. The RTX 3060 is simply the best bang for buck product from Nvidia's lineup, offering at least 35% better performance at 1080p, and as high as 47% with maximum power limits, with prices in the range of 25-30% to higher. If you can afford it, there's a good incentive here to step up to the RTX 3060. However, we're also talking about quite a sizable dollar value difference here, and not everyone will be able to afford the increase from a $950 gaming laptop to a $1,200 laptop. In those instances, the RTX 3050 is fine. It's not amazing. It is better than the RTX 3050 Ti, but overall I think it's reasonable. And in the current hardware market, I guess we have to settle for 
reasonable. Anyway, that's it for our review of the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3050 laptop GPU. Hopefully you have all the data you need for buying a laptop GPU in this new series from NVIDIA. I think we've now tested all the GPUs that NVIDIA's got on the market right now, so that's pretty nice. As always, if you're interested in supporting our laptop testing, we do have links below to some of the laptops that we talked about, and we also have our Patreon and Floatplane accounts there as well. And please do consider supporting our fundraiser for mental health research. Links to those in the description below as well we will be shaving this mustache very shortly for that course so thanks to everyone that has donated money there anyway that's it i'll catch you in the next one